Welcome to a short video on chapter six, connecting finite dimension, infinite dimension, higher geometry. And this is taking up one of the core themes, which uh, is uh, running like a red thread through the whole book and, and also through the lecture. So there's a, an intricate interplay between finite dimension, infinite dimension geometry. So what we've seen in earlier chapters is that uh, if we have manifolds, let's say for the sake of exposition here, compact manifolds M and N, so we can associate infinite dimensional manifolds and spaces to them. So for example, every manifold, of course, determines the diffeomorphism group. And since M is compact, we have seen that this diffeomorphism group is an infinite dimensional Lie group. Also, these mapping spaces, C infinity from M to N, uh, they form infinite dimension manifolds. And we have basically looked at certain lifting operations. So uh, we basically um, can lift geometry from um, the finite dimension manifold. So for example, we can use Riemannian metrics and lift them to um, weak Riemannian metrics on C infinity Mn. So for example, the L2 metric, which was discuss, uh, discussed before, and that this basically gives us a link of how we can, if we have finite dimensional geometry, how we can uh, construct infinite dimensional geometric structures. However, so the question is, of course, well, does this cut both ways? Uh, so do we only get interesting structures on the infinite dimensional ones, or do, they all, uh, do also the infinite dimensional structures have something to say about the finite dimensional um, manifolds from which they are derived? So for example, uh, I mean, we can associate to a manifold M the diffeomorphism group, but um, in, in which way uh, does the diffeomorphism group about the manifold uh, know about the manifold from which it was created? And uh, so this is basically the uh, the content of the first subchapter, which is aptly titled uh, so diffeomorphism groups. Determine their manifolds. And this is an, a rather old result due to, uh, well, in varying degrees of generality due to um, uh, many mathematicians. So this is uh, in the book, it's uh, theorem 6.1. And this is due uh, to Tarkins. Uh, so was, I think, the first one from uh, 97, uh, 70, 97, 79, uh, Philip Kiewitz. who did uh, another version in 82, Banyaga in 88, and uh, Rubin in 89. So again, I'm just giving one of the easiest versions of these results. Basically, all these mathematicians are connected to uh, the statement in various uh, forms and generalities. And basically, the statement here is if M and N are smooth, uh, compact, and connected manifolds such that there exists a group isomorphism phi from the diffeomorphism group of M to the diffeomorphism group of N. Um, This is a group isomorphism. And it's important to note here that uh, this does neither C topology nor any uh, differentiable structure. So this really means an isomorphism of the abstract groups. Um, then there exists uh, a diffeomorphism um, Psi such that uh, phi of, uh, let's say, a gamma can be written as psi composed uh, with uh, 
gamma composed with psi inverse. So a diffeomorph, uh, of course, so the signature of the diffeomorphism of psi is then a diffeomorphism from the manifold M to the manifold N. So in other words, the two underlying uh, manifolds uh, M and N we started with are diffeomorphic if their uh, diffeomorphism groups are isomorphic as groups. And this is a quite powerful result because we are neither using any kind of topology. So this, uh, so this is a rather abstract algebraic result, which uh, and the proof is rather interesting. So I won't go into details here. This is, uh, this is, um, I mean, basically, basically, I'm I'm showing off the things in the chapter which are easily uh, digestible in uh, in such a course. So we're going a little bit into the uh, into the specifics of how one would establish such an algebraic result. There are a few rather nasty uh, proof details we are not going into, but this is sort of uh, the first hint that, in a certain sense infinite dimensional geometric structures are also determining the finite dimensional uh, objects from which they are uh, from which they are derived so basically uh, what this is getting at is that the uh, that the bridge cuts both ways yeah so on one hand you can go from uh, the infinite uh, from the finite dimensional realm and build these infinite dimensional manifolds and they are useful in applications as we have seen in previous chapters but also conversely uh, they uniquely determine the objects from which they were built okay so this is uh, the subject acceptor 61 and basically we the question for the rest of the chapter is a little bit how far can this be pushed so what kind of infinite dimensional objects can we consider which um, uh, de uh, determine finite dimension geometries or finite dimension objects. And basically for this, uh, in the next subsection, we need to introduce uh, some new objects which were not discussed before. So those are Lie groupoids. Um, and their bisections. And again, I, I just want to give you some sort of flavor of what this is about. Basically, uh, if you have a group, uh, so you, we can we can think of a group like uh, a, a transformation group as something like uh, so we have one unit inside of our group, and we can think of every group element as an arrow, which um, sort of acts on uh, the unit, right? So we uh, so basically this is the group picture I want to be making, and basically every group element is in this picture uh, an arrow. Um, so this is a group. Basically, it's always since since they, these arrows are all loops, so we can always uh, compose them. So meaning we can always multiply two elements in in this picture, and and this is defined. And so a groupoid abstractly, if I give you a pictorial, uh, um, if if I give you some picture, is basically instead of having one unit, you're allowing a multitude of units. So uh, the dots are units. And uh, basically, you have lots of elements, which we also symbol, uh, symbolize here by arrows between uh, these, uh, between these uh, dots. And so there, uh, there can be loops and whatnot between those uh, things. And here we have also arrows in this direction or in that direction. And however, the point here is, so um, the difference between a groupoid and a group is, I'm only allowed to compose these arrows if, uh, let's say, we want to compose this arrow here, the red one, now with another one. Uh, so the only arrows with which them I can compose them that, uh, so as the arrow is pointing from a unit towards another unit, I can only uh, multiply this, uh, let's say, if I want to take the red arrow first, and uh, so then I need an arrow which starts at the point where the um, where the red arrow ends. So only this one blue arrow here is allowed uh, in the way where I'm uh, when I want to compose them in the way that I first take the red arrow and then any other arrow. And I can take first the red arrow and then the blue arrow, which gives me uh, which gives me then an arrow from the start of the red arrow to the end point where the blue arrow is pointing towards. But I'm not allowed to, for example, compose the uh, red arrow with any of the other arrows you see here in the picture, because there the start and end point does not match up. And the question is, of course, 
why is one interested in this um, and what what is this useful for uh, and for this let me uh, let me uh, give you an example which is which is prototypical to this uh, so we have in the shape analysis uh, section we have been looking at uh, an action of uh, the diffeomorphism group let's say of the circle on the immersions uh, from S1, let's say in R2. Uh, okay. So basically, you're taking uh, and then we obtain an immersion again from S1 to R2. And what this is going to do, it's taking an immersion and a phi, and it's just composing with this with the phi. Okay, and as one can easy check, uh, this is a group action of the diffeomorphisms on uh, the immersions. And then we said, okay, shape space is then the quotient S, where I'm basically taking the immersions and I'm quotienting out the action by diff um, S1. Okay, and now this is uh, so we are we are getting at a at a problem here. So actually, I I mean shape analysis basically seeks to do Riemannian uh, metrics and or Riemannian geometry, um, defining uh, uh, defining geodesic distances and so forth on the shape space S. But uh, so there's uh, this is a class uh, classical theorem due to uh, Michor and several collaborators. So uh, as Michor has basically shown. Uh, so S is uh, not a manifold. Why not? So the main issue here is that the group action of the diffeomorphism group is not free. So this means uh, there are um, points inside of this uh, of these immersions which are um, uh, which have uh, some stabilizer. So in a in a way, this quotient is rather uh, is rather benign. So this is not a manifold, uh, but uh, something like an infinite dimensional orbifold. So I don't want to go into de details what an orbifold is. Basically, this is it's a little bit like a manifold, but there are points which uh, which are mild singularities, in the sense that. Um, the immersions which do not uh, have uh, a trivial stabilizer they have um, a finite stabilizer subgroup so in a in a way these um, uh, these singularities are not very wild one may think of them usually as something cone shaped and i mean orbifolds are well studied and understood in in uh, finite dimensions but in infinite dimensions the the story is is completely different usually this problem that uh, s is not a manifold is ignored in uh, shape analysis so people are not uh, not really paying that much attention to it instead they're they're exploiting that in an orbifold all the points which have trivial stabilizer they form an open and dense subset so this means that uh, basically you can restrict instead of working with s you restrict to an open subset uh, which is then an honest manifold and then there everything is good but but still i mean there's this more complicated structure and the way out is um Instead of working with uh, with the ill-behaved quotient, so the idea um, is instead of working with the quotient, one uh, works with an object encoding the group action and there are suitable groupoids which are doing this so we can use groupoids to describe all the information which is contained in this group action p we are looking at here uh, without having to form the quotient which is ill uh, defined at least sort of if we are looking for a manifold and then a lee groupoid is basically the same uh, thing as a the group is to a group so a group point is abstract doesn't have a topology doesn't have a um doesn't have a uh, 
um, doesn't have a differentiable structure. And uh, so here, this is basically uh, a Lie group point is basically a, a group point plus a differentiable structure turning the group point mappings. into smooth maps with respect to the differentiable structure. So it's basically as with a group where we have uh, uh, many full circuit turning the group operations into something smooth. We basically, clock, basically copy this for these more uh, involved objects, which we call groupoids. And basically the groupoids allow us to encode a lot more uh, difficult um uh, difficult situations where we have uh, symmetries uh which may not be uh, which may not be global in a certain sense where we can encode group actions and so forth um so there are lots of interesting things we can say about groupoids i don't want to give a full fledged introduction to groupoids so there are excellent books on the subject for i mean one of the one of the standard books here is uh, mackenzie's book on on lee groupoids uh, what i want to say is basically uh so whenever whenever you are uh, let me let me just give you a little bit of uh, of flavor of these things so basically uh, a group point is often denoted with these two arrows so you have basically two things here we have a manifold uh, of units and we have another manifold of arrows and uh, two mappings here, S and T, for source and target. So and basically the, the idea is, so S is a source map, um, T is a target map. And really, just figuratively, since I, I showed you this picture, so if you are having a groupoid with different uh, nodes here giving the, uh, the units, then uh, and, uh, we would label these things X1, X2, X3 and uh, this one is the first arrow then basically the source maps role is to just give us back the unit and the target uh, is spitting out uh, the uh, um, not uh, of x2, the target is, is spitting out um, the target is spitting out what the target of this arrow is and then there are some uh, so another requirement if we are looking uh, talking about Lie group points we want uh, s and t to be submersions so this is also the reason why the concept of a Lie group point makes sense and also in our generalized setting so there's absolutely no problem with submersions uh, just look up the uh, the lecture on submersions we can have this and then there is um why do you want these things to be submersions well basically because we have a multiplication map and uh, so we basically have to take i mean so we have to take something like the cartesian product uh, of uh, the manifold of arrows with itself and then we are spitting out an arrow so this would be the right signature if we really had a group here where we could compose everything uh, with everything. However, uh, so here we basically need to restrict to a sub-manifold. So those, okay, so those, uh, so what, what we need here are all the arrows uh, or all the pairs of arrows, so arrow one, arrow two, in the Cartesian product. Uh, one too much in the Cartesian product such that, let's say, okay, depends now on how we want to compose. So the source of A1 should be equal to the target of A2. So those are the composable arrows and the multiplication um, uh, is then basically giving us a new arrow uh, depending on what that is. Uh, so uh, usually write also A1 times A2. Here. However, it's important we are not allowed to compose all of these arrows. It's uh, just some of them. And if we want the source and the target maps to be submersions, then um, this fiber product here becomes a uh, sub-manifold of the Cartesian product just by virtue of S and T being submersions and by the usual statements about uh, submersions and fiber products. 
Okay, so let me let me give you just one more example of a or one concrete example of a group point. So let's say we have an example of uh, let's say k is a compact manifold, okay, not very infinite dimensional. Uh, so we can then look at the pair group point. So this is basically, we're taking all the uh, pairs of points here in the Cartesian product. And so as um, a source map, we are basically taking, uh, oh, so we are, uh, this will give us a nice group point over K itself. And as a source map, we're taking the projection onto the second component and as a target map, we are taking the projection onto the first component. So, and then basically how you're multiplying to, uh, let's say we have K1, K2. So this is an arrow and the multiplication is concatenation. And this is only allowed if uh, the source of the arrow to the left coincides with the target of the arrow to the right. So if, uh, so basically we need to check whether this entry here is equal to that entry and uh, where well, then the concatenation is giving us the arrow k1 k3 so we are just leaving out the middleman yeah so this is the so-called pair group point of k and this is often denoted by a curly p of k all right so still why am I showing you this? If K is a compact manifold, this is a finite dimensional group point. So there's still no infinite dimensional group point. But uh, so basically, when you study group points a little bit, what you will find out is that there are lots of interesting group points which encode uh, geometries. So uh, fiber bundles can be uh, equivalently formulated as group points. And uh, so the nice thing about a group point is it basically has an associated infinite dimensional group, which, uh, which is a lot like the diffeomorphism group for a manifold. Let me just give you the definition. So if I, uh, so the, and this thing is called the bisection group of a group point. So what you basically ask is, uh, so you're looking at, uh, okay, let's say not the bisection group of any uh, group point, but let's say of a Lie group point, so that we have differentiable structure we can toy with. So uh, basically we are looking for a subset we call bis G for bisections. This is a subset of the smooth functions from the base, sorry, give you the first signatures. We are looking at a group point G with manifold of arrows G uh, over some manifold of units. And so we are looking at smooth maps from M to G. Uh, and basically what we want uh, is, so we're looking at mappings F, which are, uh, so this is a bisection if and only if First and uh, first and foremost, if we are composing with the uh, source map, then we get the identity on M. And if we're composing with the target map, then we get some diffeomorphism of M. Right. So on the base. So on one hand, this is really on the nose a section of the source. And up to a diffeomorphism, it is, is well, it's almost a section of the target. And um, so, well, why why is one doing uh, this thing? So in a, in a way, these bisections can, uh, come up very naturally. We can think of them as generalized objects um, or generalized arrows in the group point, because again, if we are uh, if we have these units here, for example, and we have some arrows. Um, between them, um, looping, whatever. So if I'm, uh, if I want to graphically give you a bisection F, so then I basically for every unit I have, this selects one arrow which sticks out from this uh, from this unit and goes somewhere else. Maybe this this is doing it. Uh, 
in a certain sense and here let's say we have, we have some here and basically it has to do this in this way where uh well it it's always an arrow which is starting at uh the given uh unit and it's uh, possibly returning somewhere else uh, however, the result of uh, of the return map uh, composed with this bisection needs to be a diffeomorphism. So this needs to be uh, as nice as can be. And if I have two bisections, so these bisections uh, um, form a group. Basically, if I have two bisections, sigma and tau, I can define a product which is usually called star. And... Uh, so in pictorial things, so if we are starting at a unit which is called x, so the uh, sigma of x is an arrow. Uh, sorry, we need to start with tau. Always forgetting the, uh, the order. Tau of x is an arrow sticking out uh, from x to some other point. So this is the target of tau of x. And on this uh, on this other point, we have an, we get another arrow which uh, is given by sigma of tau uh, of the target of tau of x. So this arrow is determined by, by the sigma and what the composition then does, it's basically giving us the composite of go, uh, go first using tau, then go using sigma. And this is giving us some arrow from the, so, uh, from the source of the, uh, so from x to whatever this other point up here is. And in formula, what you can check. Uh, so the formula, if this, uh, this is okay, first we take tau of x. So this is the arrow, this is easy, but then we have to apply sigma to the target of tau of x. And then we uh, just use the groupoid multiplication to concatenate these two things. And well, I'm not going to give you the inverse. This is, um, uh, this is not hard to figure out. The uh, unit in this group is the identity section. And what I want to show you just uh, to make more sense of why this is a good idea to actually talk about this after we talk about the diffeomorphism group, let's take a look again, our friend the pair groupoid uh, from, uh, for a compact manifold source uh, and target. So basically we are looking at a mapping which is going up here uh, and which is associating uh, so uh, so let's let's call this let's call this bisection also sigma so sigma of k this is uh, an object uh, where k1 let's label it with sigma and k2 labeled with sigma okay and now let's let's take a look at what happens so we need s composed with sigma of k, this needs to be the identity, so we need to get k. So if we are just skipping back to the definition, so s is a projection onto the second component. So this basically means that uh, we have identified the second component here, so this is always k. And now uh, we still have one condition left for this to be a bisection. So t composed with sigma of k, well, this t composed with sigma this is basically giving us the first uh, element here in the pair. And we don't, unfortunately, we cannot directly identify what this is. But what we know is that T composed with sigma is uh, a diffeomorphism. So um, if we are removing uh, this here, so uh, we do not know what the element is, but so this is a diffeomorphism. And what this is basically telling us, and this is why this is interesting, so uh, for the pair groupoid, uh, P, let's say, of a compact manifold, if, I, if we're computing the bisections of the pair groupoid for this compact manifold, then uh, this one is isomorphic as a, first as an abstract group, to the diffeomorphism group of K. And basically the, the isomorphism is giving you composing a given bisection with the target map and forget uh, forget the second component which didn't contribute anything. So it's, e uh, so it's an easy exercise to check that uh, this is actually a group isomorphism. So exercise. 
check that uh, this is a group isomorphism and actually if you are if you're going through further examples which i'm not going to get into of uh, lee group points basically computing the bisections group you uh, bisection group you find that for a lot of these uh, lee group points you end up uh, with well-known infinite dimensional Lie groups. So for example, for the fiber bundle, you uh, end up, uh, or for the, I should say, for the group, for the Lie group point attached to a fiber bundle, you end up with a bisection group, which um, has something to do with gauge transformations for this, uh, for this fiber bundle. And uh, so all of these things uh, turn out to be infinite dimensional Lie groups. And basically the rest of the chapter is, uh, so, investigating the question uh, so do bisection groups determine uh, let's say finite dimensional geometric structures let me be vague here what I mean by geometric structures. Basically, I do not want to give you a full-fledged introduction to what a Lie group point is. So there are there are much nicer books to read, or you are reading this chapter where you find lots of examples. Um, but the question is, uh, can we do something similar for these bisection groups? So the the mantra is basically uh, infinite dimension Lie group points are. Um, useful because they are determined or they uh, they get determined by some finite dimensional structures like uh, fiber bundles or uh, or geometries induced by fiber bundles um, so we can look at associate bisection groups and maybe if we are lucky and there are conditions and uh, it's not as nice as with the diffeomorphism group and the nice result uh, by Tarkins and all the other uh, mathematicians we saw beforehand so, uh, however, one can show that in certain circumstances, the bisection groups uh, and um, and some other uh, structures associated with these infinite dimensional group points determine uniquely finite dimensional geometric structures. So, in principle, what this ch chapter tries to achieve is trying to build a bridge back and forth between finite and infinite dimensional geometry via uh, using the so-called higher geometry of Lee group points.